joining me. Um, I'm super excited again because um, our next guest um, is an award-winning uh, journalist, travel writer. Um, he's um, pretty incredible when you hear the things that he's been up to. Um, so I'm, I, I just can't wait to, to say hello to him <laughs> and he's just sitting in front of me. So good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank How you for are you, me. Tarek? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. So Tarek Hussain, mm -hmm. award-winning <laughs> journalist, <laughs> travel writer. You've done everything. Yes. No, I've, I've been doing quite a few things. Um, my main focus is um, travel writing, but I do um, obviously do a bit of journalism and the award is actually for radio work. Yes. So, um, yeah, no, I've now been doing this for about three or four years. And um, the kind of work that I like to do is specifically focused on Islamic heritage. Yeah. So um, the travel writing, when I do it, I tend to focus on going out and exploring and unearthing the kind of Muslim heritage that most people don't know about mm -hmm. in kind of places that you wouldn't expect. And one of the reasons that, you know, I really um, wanted to do this and got into this is because I feel like it's an it's a it's a kind of industry and a profession and, and, and a way of um, working that really we don't have in our communities. I don't think we can name another Bangladeshi travel writer or even another Muslim travel writer. Mm. You have bloggers. Yeah, you, you know? do. And I was going to say, what, what is the difference between mm. people that go on holidays and they take pictures and they talk about where they've gone to? Mm -hmm. you, I see a lot of travel bloggers Indeed. in the community. But what's a travel writer? So um, for me, um, the, the, the biggest distinction is that a travel writer is closer to a real journalist in, in many ways without being disrespectful to bloggers. Yeah. Um, whereas bloggers, I find, tend to do um, pieces that are more short form. Um, they tend to be more focused on maybe commercialising their writing. Obviously, some bloggers are very kind of um, focused about a specific passionate area of theirs. But a travel writer like myself is more interested in writing long form about a destination, writing in articles in major publications and newspapers. And our articles tend to go into further depth and detail, maybe the socio-historical context of a place, the cultural aspect of it. And um, we like to think that we offer the reader a little bit more. Um, and a travel writer is also someone who's more concerned with maybe writing books and stuff like that as well. OK, yeah. let's go back to the radio work that you've recently done. And you've won an award, yes. which is fantastic. <laughs> yes. Let's talk about that. I mean, you went to America and you were, um, I guess, uh, going into uh, discovering um, mosques. Mm -hmm. in America. Can, can you talk about that? Yes. So the award was actually um, given to me in 2016 when I did a two-part radio documentary. Um, and you, you'll probably remember that 2016 was a fascinating, hearing, um, a fascinating year in um, world politics. We had the Brexit situation over here in the UK and we had um, Trump running for presidency over in the US. Now, the, the negative side effect of all of this is that Muslims were getting it in the neck on both sides of the Atlantic. And um, one of the things that I really, really wanted to do and I felt really kind of honoured and blessed to be able to do was to highlight the fascinating Islamic heritage of America, something that I felt people really did, had no idea about, including Americans over there. And um, so we ended up going over to the US and um, we did a two part documentary. In the first part, we explored um, some of the oldest surviving mosques. Now, I should make it clear that, you know, Islamic heritage doesn't start with the mosque that I explored. Islamic heritage in the US was there during the slave um, period and probably even before that. But a lot of that. Um, a lot of that history is no longer accessible. You just do not have the antiquities or the documents there. So the stuff we were looking at is during the mass migration that brought Europeans over to the US. And actually one of the most fascinating mosques which I discovered um, through work I'd done in Europe was a mosque in Brooklyn that was set up and founded by Lithuanian, Polish and Belarusian Muslims. Now, most of our audience here today probably aren't even sure that there are Muslims yeah. in that part of the world. And yet this was a community who had a 600 year old history already in Europe as yeah. Muslims. And then they went over there and founded this mosque that had almost been completely forgotten because it wasn't even being used as a mosque in many ways. And then the other mosque that we um, focused on very early on was founded by Syrian and Lebanese people. Well, let's take a little um, a look at the clip um, yes. of some of the work you've done. No worries.
I grew up in Tower Hamlets. Um, I went to a local school here. Um, even my university education was not too far from um, ta um, London. It was in Middlesex. And then I've gone on to um, study at Greenwich as well. But I was born in Bangladesh, of course. Very early age. I always loved to read. Um, I always enjoyed then trying to write my own stories. And, you know, writing was something that always fascinated me because I saw it as more than just um, documentation. I saw it as a form, kind of art form. And I really appreciated good writing. So I always aspired to be a good writer. Where every time I traveled across to um, Europe and I went to different countries, I would ask myself, well, what is out here? Is, is, is there any Islamic history out here? And, and I would do a little bit of research beforehand. But a lot of it I discovered as I was out there and, you know, just, just from local knowledge and wandering around. A friend of mine who's a radio um, producer approached me and said, you know, you're, you're doing some amazing stuff, you're discovering these amazing stories, would you like to do something on radio? And so we had a conversation and at the time I'd, I'd just come back from the Baltic, which is Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and I'd written about this um, forgotten 600-year-old Muslim community. So I just wanted to create something that would represent Muslims in America. Well, I was astonished when I came back to find that Firstly, it was the biggest download um, on the BBC World Service radio, and then um, it got shortlisted for the best religious program on radio for 2016 at the New York festivals. And um, I just thought getting shortlisted in itself was amazing for your first radio show, but then I went and won. So, so that was that was pretty pretty astounding. It did it did knock me for six. I must admit. I like to travel with my family. I like to explore things with them. We, you know, the, the whole summer. There was um, four of us in a car for a month and a bit, you know, and, and that was that was me researching this stuff, but also enjoying a great holiday with my family. That looked amazing. <laughs> that honestly, I mean, I think your job is like it looks like you literally have travelled the world, and um, it's wonderful to see that you're looking at Muslim heritage, something that I don't think you know. You were talking about the the Lonely Planet guides. Um, mm. You know, I've picked a few up from the bookstores, and there isn't anything that I feel caters for mm. um, people that want to learn more about. Uh, the, the Muslim side of, of these countries. So I think it's wonderful mm -hmm. um, what you're doing. Um, the documentary obviously won, um, was the best radio international program of the year. That's wonderful. You were shortlisted for AIB as well. Um, so you're on a roll here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really, really good. <laughs> it's, it's going well. It's going well. I'm really, really um, chuffed with um, how things have panned out so far. But I think what it also says is that there is a real thirst mm. for this stuff in our community right now, whether it's the Bangladeshi community or whether it's the wider Muslim community. I think people are interested in heritage. People are interested in knowing more about our history also over here in the Western Hemisphere. Because, mm. you know, whilst we might have Bangladeshi roots and um, we might be from, you know, other parts of the world as individuals, we all live here now, you know, and there is a massive amount of Islamic heritage on our doorsteps that will make us feel much more at home if we just knew it was there. Yeah. And do you know what I liked about your um, the documentary, the follow up, yeah. where you went after a year yes. to see how um, how the the you know, having Donald Trump as president for for a year, how that's impacted the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. What I enjoyed when I was listening to that was that you interviewed people from all denominations of Islam. Mm -hmm. um, and that was nice to hear, because I think sometimes when you think about a Muslim in mainstream media, you think of a man with a beard or you think a woman with wearing a headscarf. Mm -hmm. But actually, you spoke to people that look like me, look like you, you know, they, they were different and they had mm -hmm. different views. And it was just nice to hear mm -hmm. how what their experiences are like. And actually, it was also quite interesting to hear a Muslim man saying that he actually thinks Donald Trump is right in his ways, which was bizarre, but it was good to have those point of views. Mm, mm. How was that experience so for that you? That was really, really fascinating. So like you say, it was a follow up to the um, to the documentary that won the award. And we went, we wanted to go a year exactly after Donald Trump had come into the presidential um, seat. And we wanted to get an impression of how American Muslims were faring under his presidency um, a year on. And of course, from the outside, it often seems like it's all doom and gloom. And um, to be honest, when I went on the on the original journey, I thought that's what was going to come through. But actually, a year on, most Americans have kind of come come to terms with, look, he's in he's in office now. What are we going to do about it? And what was really, really beautiful, and I think what came through in the, in the documentary was that Muslims in America are using their faith to turn this into a positive. 
and they're determined to show the world that, you know, they will not be beaten. They will not be um, silenced and that actually they're here to stay. They're making wonderful contributions and they're helping to make America great, just like they always have done, mm -hmm. which is a message that I feel like wasn't coming through on other platforms. You know, often the focus was on this attack has happened, this negative aspect or something bad is happening here or something very sad is happening over there. And it is happening. Mm. Of course it is. But I really wanted a message of hope mm. to come through. You know, I wanted I wanted to show how our faith as Muslims can help us even in some of the darkest times. Mm. And and it, that came through and it was it was refreshing mm. um, to listen to. Um, I hope you go back again <laughs> and do another <laughs> follow up. Um, now, let's talk about you. Um, you're writing a book at the moment, aren't you? Indeed. Yes. Yes. So, so talk to us about about that. So the book I'm working on right now, which I'm trying to, you know, get a few agents to pick up. So if any are listening, <laughs> so the, the book is focused on actually a journey that me and my family took in 2016. Again, 2016 was that very fascinating year. And we left just after the Brexit vote. So, you know, we left with the news that we were going to be leaving Europe and we were heading into Europe on this journey. And the journey was actually across six of the Balkan countries. Um, they are Bosnia, um, Serbia, Kosovo, Albania, Macedonia and Montenegro, countries that don't immediately spring to mind for a summer holiday. But the reason we wanted to go out there is firstly, as a family, we love Eastern Europe. But more importantly for me, three of those countries have a Muslim majority population. That means these are Muslims who are European through and through. They're born and bred Europeans. They're not people who converted. They're not people who found Islam at some point. They've been their families have been Muslim for like five, six centuries. So they are what you would call European Muslims. So these are three Muslim countries in Europe. And the other three countries also have a massive indigenous European Muslim community as well. And the journey is all about highlighting the fact that actually Europe has this very, very deep but living Islamic heritage. Because a lot of our listeners, um, sorry, a lot of our viewers here will actually know about all this fascinating stuff in Spain and Sicily and Portugal. Mm. And everyone's discovering that now, which was what got me excited early on when I first started this like 10, 15 years ago. But actually that stuff is... Um, archaic. It's something that you go and visit and it's a monument. There's nothing living there anymore from an Islamic perspective, um, even if some people want to revitalise it. But when you go to the Balkans, you're meeting living European Muslims, descendants of the Ottomans, descendants of the Tatars, you know, and, and the, the, the Islam that they carry with them and the Muslim culture that they practice is very much a European Islam. Mm. You know, it's, it's an Islam that is at home in Europe, something that we don't hear about. Well, you don't see at We all. don't see, we don't hear about it. And we're made to believe that Europe, um, sorry, Islam doesn't belong in Europe. And, and so the book is trying to, as well as being a nice journey where the reader goes with us through these wonderful countries and, and sees these beautiful mosques and these madrasas and these, and these farms where Muslims are living in these little villages it's also a very very powerful message at a time when um, things like Brexit things like Trump are telling Muslims that we don't belong in the West mm. it's a strong reminder that not only do we belong in the West but we've been here for centuries and some of us are still alive and we're indigenously blonde blue-eyed Europeans as well mm. um, now let's talk about um, where we go next I mean you've obviously got the book mm. um, uh, what can you say to the viewers out there about how they can learn more about um, our Muslim heritage mm -hmm. through traveling? So I think the, the, the easiest way, you know, we live in an age where we are extremely lucky. It's, I, I think, you know, I would term it the information age. We have an overload of information. And to be brutally honest, anywhere you go in the world, if you just type in the word mosque for that area, you're likely to find a mosque. And that's always a great place to start because by going to the mosque and meeting the locals, you can get to know about the Muslim culture of a place. And that's always a great way to start. And you find that wherever you are, whatever part of the world you are, there's always a little Muslim community somewhere there. You know, most recently, me and my wife were out in Georgia, you know, which is a very, very... Um, strongly Christian country, you know, um, and my wife identified this um, mosque in the corner of it close to the Turkish border and what have you. And the fact that it's near the Turkish border obviously means there's going to be some Muslims there. We went there, not only did we find a mosque, but we found this whole array of ancient um, Muslim villages out in the mountains and that, which I want to go back and explore. And that all came about because I wanted to go there and, and, and look for what wasn't 
obvious and in front of you because far too often travel literature, historic narratives have been written by people who aren't looking at the Muslim perspective. And that's one of the things I'm trying to change through the work mm. I'm doing so that it's easier for us to find it. But, you know, anywhere people go in the world, they'll, they'll be able to find that kind of stuff. Mm. Now, you've caused quite a stir in, um, in the mainstream media with some mm -hmm. articles. Yeah. Let's talk about the article um, that you wrote about Vikings. Yes, yeah, so this was a really, really um, interesting piece for a number of reasons. It was interesting in the first instance because it, on the surface it seemed to be mind-blowing, it seemed to be groundbreaking. Um, a scholar, um, an academic in Sweden, did a press release where she wrote that um, she had discovered these items of funeral clothing in a Viking grave, um, dating all the way back to something like the ninth century. Um, and it seemed as though there was inscriptions on these um, items of clothing in Arabic. And it said Allah and Ali. So the fact that she'd done a press release and everything, I picked this up and I wrote this for the BBC and it went absolutely mental. You know, every single major um, news platform in this country and across the world followed my lead. And, and most of them quoted me. And so, you know, I was having a whale of a time thinking, wow, you know, this is great. You know, it's gone viral across the globe and everything. But then things took a little bit of a turn that made it quite interesting. And it was an important lesson for me as well. Um, a few academics who were experts on this kind of Arabic literature came to the fore and said that, you know, the, the academic that I got the work from should not have made that release into the press without first verifying it, having it peer reviewed. Mm. And this kind of stuff I'm aware of because I'm, I'm an aspiring academic myself. But I assumed because it was a press release, this had already been verified. Yeah. So it then turned into a slightly kind of um, controversial scenario, shall we say. Oh, do you know what? We've run out of time and I wish we can go on for longer. <laughs> um, will you come back next yes, time? I'd course. love to know what, what, what yeah. you, you know, especially about the book. Yes, hopefully I'll have a published book. Yeah. Maybe even an award to go for the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Look.